three, two, one. Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Barry Canty. I am SVP of Marketing at IBEX, and very excited to have you with us for today's webinar, which is entitled, How Indeed and IBEX Built an Insights-Driven CX Partnership. Today, we'll be discussing how Indeed and IBEX have built a blueprint for successful partnerships between a brand and its BPO provider. Uh, with us today, two very experienced speakers. Uh, first up from Indeed is Prabhu Kanan where he is a director of research and development. How's it going today, Prabhu? Not too bad. Good to see you, Barrett. Hey, John. Great to have you with us. And from IBEX, we have John Thompson, who is our head of sales. Hey, John. Hey, Barry. How are you? Prabhu, great to see you again. Yeah, yeah. Good to have you both on. I think this is going to be a great conversation. Uh, just quickly, for those of you who have not been on an IBEX webinar before, who are unfamiliar with us, uh, we are a tech-driven BPO delivering CX solutions to many of the world's top brands across all verticals, powered by a global team of 30,000 CX professionals. Uh, a few housekeeping items before I hand it over to Prabhu and John. Please feel free to submit questions throughout this webinar. Uh, we have received some questions during registration and we'll answer some of those. Uh, Prabhu and John will provide either responses via text uh, in, the, in the chat Q&A app or uh, verbally here on the call. Uh, the recording of this webinar uh, will be shared with all registrants so you can view again or share with your colleagues. So John and Prabhu, let's go ahead and jump in. The first section of our conversation will be discussing uh, selection process, if you will, um, that indeed leverages for partnering with BPO providers. Uh, so Prabhu, we cannot assume that everyone on this call is familiar with Indeed. So could you maybe give a high-level overview of, of Indeed and then transition into your selection process and how you evaluate BPOs? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, for those of you on with Indeed, uh, Indeed is a HR tech platform. We're one of the largest um, providers of jobs. And today, I think um, we're transforming to become a recruitment as a service company. Uh, we you know we started about 15 years ago. It's been a big uh, journey and um, some great, amazing partnerships along the way. And I think and uh, we're excited for the future. Thanks for that, Prabhu. And then um, also, could you talk a little bit about at a high level how you select BPO partners and maybe give whatever insight possible uh, to the traits you look for in a BPO provider? Absolutely, I think. Um, picking a BPA partner is a very important part of our overall process. I think this also plays directly into how successful we are in the marketplace, because if, if you don't have the right partners, then you're, you aren't able to move at the same speed in the marketplace and, and have first mover advantage. So I think when you look at good partners, we look at a few different criteria that are important to us. I think first is uh, we have to maintain the trust of our customers. So I think looking at a provider and saying, do they have like business experience? Have they done something similar? Does it have to be the same type of business? But in general, for example, if it's content moderation, do they have experience with it? Do they have the right tools? Do they have the right technology? And can they pair up with it? I think uh, talking about tools and technology, I think innovation is very important to the company. We use a lot of data um, and to drive a lot of our decisions. So finding another BPO provider that uses data to make decisions is also important for us. I think the last part of it, and I think there's a couple other things that are important. This is we care about society and I think we want to make sure that the people working in these outsourcing companies have job satisfaction and that they are, you know what I mean? And has a good impact on society, right? And this is a business. I think speed and price are key as well. It's not like they, they don't matter. They, they do matter availability of location and change tolerance. How soon can we ship new change? I think those are some high level parameters what we look at in a, in a successful partner. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Prabhu. And John, just coming to you, uh, when you think about um, uh, building a successful partnership with a brand, um, how do you see it from the BPO perspective? Yeah, so first of all, uh, great thoughts, Prabhu. And again, really appreciate the partnership. Thank you. Um, I, I would, I would I would look at it like this. When outsourcing 
was, you know, in its infancy stages. A lot of the relationship was, hey, just take everything that we do and you, you as the provider go replicate it. Don't ask questions, just go stamp the widget. I think as this industry has evolved, the, the, the true measure of a great partnership is the realization that um, companies like Ibex are touching the company's largest, most important asset, and that's their customers. So how do you work together to drive, I think, a couple of key things? One is transparency in the partnership. How are you communicating to each other? How are you um, uh, being able to kind of share what we're hearing on the ground back into uh, the client level? And the, that can be a number of different ways you do that. Some of that's data-driven. Other places is just really open, transparent communication between the two sides. And then second, secondarily is a little bit of what Prabhu was saying is, hey, how do you how do you look at the mix of culture between the two organizations to ensure that we're like lockstep? Because um, at you know our people, especially on the ground, they interact as they would if they're an Indeed employee a little bit. They are living and breathing the ethos of Indeed. And so at that stage, are we kind of matching cultures and being really uh, aligned is, is, is important. And I think then if you have those two key ingredients together, then you can kind of work through most problems that kind of come through along the, along the trajectory. But I think those are probably the two, two biggest ones. Well, thanks for that, John. And I like the culture piece. Uh, we haven't spoken about that yet. Um, Prabhu, can you, for our audience, maybe provide some best practices for transmitting brand culture to the BPO partner? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And thanks for that, John. I think it's important, like what you were talking about. I think coming back to it, I think if I were to just state one statement, it would be, I think, how do we avoid transactional thinking in a partnership, right? I think that's important. How do we not just think about that one interaction, but think about it holistically and say, are customers calling in? Are they having a good experience? Are they able to, to answer the questions that they're asking us? I think when it comes back to that, it's about how do we create value for customers? They already have to stop and pick up the phone and talk to someone. How do we create value? And I think for that, it's understanding the value system behind it. I think, and Indeed has some great values behind it, right? I think when you talk about it, we care about job seeker first. We want to talk about pay for performance. We want to talk about how we're data driven innovation, inclusion, belonging, all of these, I think, have to come across in that one phone call. And I think that's why picking the right CX partner is so critical because that one agent at that phone call has the, uh, the great opportunity to influence that customer in being loyal and in being with our brand, right? I think it's so important. I agree. I agree. Uh, thanks for that, Prabhu. Uh, we actually had uh, a question that came in during registration that I think is relevant uh, to this section of the conversation. Um, Prabhu, I think uh, you can jump on it first, and then John, I'm sure you'll have some perspective as well. Uh, and the question is this, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges when starting a new CX partnership? Now, I think anytime you start a new CX partnership, I think... Uh, Again, the key is keeping the customer in the center of all of this, right? I think the next parts of this would be where to kind of create a plan for this would be, do we have a, a defined vision? Do we understand our customers? Do we know segmentation? Do we have the right tooling in place, right? And I think, and, and do we have the right quality sprayer? And some of this is a, a partnership, and that's why this is a true partnership at a two-way street between our CX partner and indeed, right? Because we can't expect our partner to do all of it themselves being like, yeah, throw it across the fence and be like, you know, own our CX, like, see you later and let's see you at the QBR and we'll see how they can do, right? I think it's truly, do we have a vision? Are we able to communicate that out? Do we have the right tooling in place? And I think, do we create that expertise and are we going to hire the right talent? Because I think that's the key to it is every CX, you know, depending on the channel you have, can they, move across channels, can they engage your customers? So there's a few of those to me very important. And ultimately, it'd be measured the return on investment, right? Do we know 
what value we're adding to our customers. Not just from a company standpoint, but from a customer standpoint, aren't they getting our wife in that photo or that experience? Yeah, I I love your um, kind of shared vision aspect of that, Prabhu, because I, I think it's my 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 favorite thing to say. It's like a it's like a marriage, right? And when you're first getting married, you're trying to like figure out how like this is all going to play together a little bit. Um, but it, it is the shared vision that keeps you moving through whatever patch you're in. But then it's it's I, I love to say it's like you kind of feeling out is you, you gonna say what you do and do what you say and 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 how every client has a different cadence and one of the big my favorite kind of takeaways when when you were in Jamaica a, a few months back was you really kind of caring and, and probably you had said hey you're the front line I want to hear what's going on so we can make what we do on the Indeed side better. And then when you execute against that, both parties really know that it is meaningful that you're, you're, you mean what you say. So then we can go and do that and deliver against that think is, is really, really important in a partnership. And I think I, I, I go back to, I love the marriage analogy because a little bit of this kind of figuring out how are these, how is this going to work together? And, and I think adding on to it, I think. But whenever we come on site, it was great for us to be come on site and listen. And I think that's the key for us is for me, the importance is whenever I'm on site, I, I, I tell myself I'm here to listen, not to tell anyone, right? I think listening there, I think is the most successful thing you could do and not say too many things, right? Because I think you have so much information that comes at you. I think trying to impose something through, I think that could come later on. But just listening and, and truly listening to the front line and being like, what is it that you really care about? Then you can truly hear what it is and then you can find opportunities to fix those. I think that's the piece. Keep an open mind, listen, and then actually fix those things. That'd be commitment to that partnership. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I agree. Now we're going to transition to the management phase. So post-launch, um, how the relationship uh, develops. Um, so Prabhu, I'll, I'll come to you first. Um, after uh, you've lost with the BPO partner, uh, can you talk about some of those ongoing variables that you monitor and maybe provide some best practices post-launch uh, once a BPO has uh, begun working with a, with a brand? In a particular question, I think this is, I, I think, you, you know, as you look at it, finding a partner, launching with a partner, all the smarts, these are some very important stages in the maturity and the continuous improvement cycle of how we continue to build an effective partnership. And I think for us, the biggest things, you know, as soon as you launch, I think making sure that ahead of time, you have a glide path defined, you know what those metrics are that hit. Uh, you, you know, you know, there's a cliff and you know that it's not going to be like, oh, we launched today, tomorrow, it's going to be like, a hundred percent, right? Like I think knowing that and setting that expectation, right? Both at the vendor level, at the agent level, and with an indeed and at that leadership level to say, hey, here's what you could expect and making sure that we've talked about it, communicated that clearly and have a documented plan, I think removes a lot of the back and forth of like, you know, you're not doing what we told you. Like I think that's important. I think the second part of this, I'm coming back to the tools and technology making sure that we know what we're measuring and having expectations of how to measure that and what data we're going to look at, I think is critical. I think over communication or communicating more and making sure that we're on the same page, I think is critical to it. Having a, sorry, I talked about having a quality framework. I think deciding that and making sure that it's not set in a stone, right? I think it's in a bottom business, something's changing. So be open to feedback and making sure that our plan of us for us to tweak our standards and making sure how we can meet where our customers are asking us, I think is also critical because sometimes the biggest thing is you can be like, we told you you need to hit this, but then locking too much, right? Because then you don't allow some room to to absorb the changes in the business because everything sheet is constant. So I think being things tired was key to, to managing it post launch. Great, great. And you mentioned metrics. Um, could you talk a little bit about the important metrics at March uh, for for the Indeed team? Yeah, I think um, 
it, depending on the business we have, but I think if we, let's say uh, we own in and say it's a phone business, right? For us, I think the key phone metrics for me, the gold standard would be customer satisfaction. Are our customers satisfied, satisfied with that interaction? Are they satisfied with the resolution they're getting, right? I think those two are the kind of gold standard or the North Star where we want to go to. And I think there's a bunch of metrics in between, right? Because you have to look at staffing levels, incoming volume, we have to look at we tend not to pivot too much on things like average speed to answer or stuff like that, because I think that could be important, but not necessarily what truly drives the customer satisfaction, unless you're like, hey, we're getting 100 calls a day and we have like two agents available, right? Clearly, we have to look at some metric like that, but I think making sure that we can predict this, but I think those are like table stakes. I think what we truly should care about is, is the customer having a good experience? And are our agents able to feel knowledge and are they teaching them and giving them the right information for them to provide good conversations that have an organic conversation, right? Instead of them feeling like they're read off of a script. And I think we can talk later about to like the expanding scope of, I think, controlling that with experimentation and doing one thing at a time so that the agents feel comfortable with each interaction and then slowly expanding what they're doing so that it's more organic than being like dumping all aside of them at the same time. You know? Right, right, right. No, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And John, question for you from a BPO standpoint at launch, uh, what are we focused on? Yeah, I mean, I think you'll see in a lot of our messaging, speed to green is a big thing for us. Um, and, but how do you get to that, I think, is where the nuance is, um, is it, after you launch, are you, have you put in, which I, what I consider is really important is, you know, purposeful built tools for agents to be successful across the entire life cycle of how they onboard and work with our organization. And there are things in the front end recruiting that are pre-launch, but post-launch, are you looking at training, deciding, hey, where do you implement technology after the first wave zero training classes to drive improved speed to proficiency for the next wave of uh, associates that kind of come through the door. That's an example. But then when I love what Prabhu was mentioning, there's two like KPIs, I think kind of, and Prabhu, I'd love your thoughts on this. You kind of sit in two buckets in my mind. You have tactical KPIs. These are ones that are SLAs and if you miss them, staffing you kind of mentioned, that's a tactical fix. How do we go fix a tactical problem? Then there are strategic KPIs, you know, customer satisfaction that you want to dig really deep into the data to kind of understand what's the grind in the in the process that's either driving up that KPI, maybe sometimes drive, you know, driving it down. Is it systems or changes on the client side that drive it down? They don't know it because it was produced somewhere and they didn't know that was going to impact CSAT or is there something tribal knowledge that we intake as a as a as the as the provider that was kind of driving CSAT and we need to then partner back to kind of go back to that. And then, you know, so we we'll probably talk about this a little bit later in the webinar, but how do you implement business intelligence to dig into that data in order to really understand the strategic because I think the tactical is what ops should be figuring out and playing with every day. And then leadership should be looking at the strategic and understanding what are some of the things that are behind that. But probably I'd love your your thoughts into kind of how I bucketed and looked at it. Yeah, no, and I, I think that pre, I think there are definitely tactical KPIs that I don't want to like, you know, wave my hand at things like, hey, I'm staffing and being able to get to the fellow and like how long the conversations take, right? Because I think how long the conversation takes could also dictate hey, uh, is the agent proficient enough or are they just trying to find the answer or is this truly complicated but should be be estimated, right? I think, do we have the right scope to find? Do we have the right documentation? And I think it's also looking at what I call change velocity. How fast are we changing things? And do we have a trackable or changing? And do we have a change log? Have we changed everything today and then expect some things to be great tomorrow, right? Probably not. So I think tracking some of these with the minded level to say, uh, and then making sure that we have alignment on how we're measuring satisfaction, both at the agent level and at the customer level is also critical. Are the agents satisfied? Do they feel happy? Do they want to come to work? 
Do they want to talk to more customers? I think is an important metric I think we need to start mentioning too, you know, to some extent. Do they feel happy about this? And if they're not, the, the customer interaction is also going to suffer because of that. You know what I mean? Who agent satisfaction ties back to customer satisfaction too at some level? Yeah, no, thanks for that. Probably. And the question actually just, just popped in my head uh, regarding agent satisfaction. Um, from your perspective, are you leveraging BPO, uh, ENPS scores, uh, employment satisfaction scores? Can you talk a little bit about how you use that information? You know, there's definitely a, uh, a soft line in the sand here, both client employment, right? As, as how much we can leverage some of this data. that, but I think we would definitely like to see this. We like it where it's sharing with us, not that we're going to take action. You know, the same reason we're not our interview loops for your agents, right? Like there is a line somewhere, but I think we love seeing it. I think we'll love all their engagement activities and the different uh, competitions that I best runs when we run on site, right? I think it, it, it shows us, you know, I definitely go look at blaster scores for companies we're going to contact with, right? To look at me, like, what is the average satisfaction of this employee? I mean, you know, that's a decent indication from a public standpoint of what's available. And so those drive some of it, but we, you know what I mean? I just have to be careful when we look at it, you know, tell my team this is like, yeah, look at the information, but make sure we're not taking any direct action tied to it because we can get into, well, you know, tricky areas here. Absolutely. Absolutely. John, any thoughts on BPO, ENPS, and, and the importance there? I mean, you know, in, in our, in our business culture is king it. And so how do we measure our EMPS globally it is really, really important for, I think a single reason, not all, uh, culture or, you know, corporate initiatives in terms of employee engagement and satisfaction is one size fits all in a global company. So you, you, yeah, you want to measure it globally to say, okay, what, what are we doing right that's uh, appropriate across every site and every geography? But then how are also you measuring that at the local level? Because we all know that at the local le level, a lot of what drives employee satisfaction is is a, a derivative of, of the country that we're supporting our people in. And so we have to capture that data and make those tweaks along the way so that, you know, at every step of the way we are, you know, driving the right employee satisfaction um, at a, I think at a site level and probably at a campaign level as well. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that, John. And we had a question just come in uh, related to launch. Uh, so I'll pose it to both of you. Uh, if a launch does not go as expected, as expected, do you have any tips for how to get things back on track between a brand and its BPO partner? Any advice? I'm not sure. I can jump in right here. Yeah. Uh, I, I think if you've been around for over 10 years in this industry, you know that we've had a few launches go off. If you have any, please come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you. If you haven't had anything go wrong, you know what I mean? That's a very exciting if you go. Uh, I think the key when things go off, I think that's a true test of a part, good partnership is when things go south, right? So I think the key for me first is always taking a look at the decision and having a risk blog. What did we decide, which made us get here, right? Like, it, and it's not about finding fault or trying to assign blame with people. It's just holistically looking at the entire thing and saying, what did we miss? So it's all about, uh, do we have a lot of decisions or going back to find root cause of which decision we made took us off? It could have been something in the environment changing. It could have been price points changing. It might have been top of dinner coming in, a lot of different things. So finding that decision lock we have coming back to assigning risk to each of these and then making sure that we can work through it. But at that level, if there's no trying to figure out who did this, but it's all about like, how do we fix it? Then we can come back to later in RCA to say that. But I think also looking at, is there a revenue impact? Is there a customer's impact? And I think all of that changed the complexity of how we did that or who takes ownership of it, you know? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, John, any thoughts? Yeah, I go back to I kept when I mentioned um, an earlier question, which is transparency. Being able to raise your hand very quickly and say, "Hey, we need help." There's nothing. There's no. There's no. There's no wrong in doing that. And I think uh, probably very uh, salient point, which is, you know, not to assign blame, but to like work together 
to solve the problem and then afterwards kind of look where your breakage was so you don't repeat the same mistakes over and over again. But I think you, you don't want to, as a partner, sit on the partner side. What you don't want to do is like sweep things under the rug because uh, they will all come out. You would rather just be open, honest, transparent, and then work to a solution. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, so, so far we've talked about selection process and the uh, stage right after launch. So now I'd like to get into um, evaluating the performance over a six to 12 month period. Um, uh, Prabhu, I'll, I'll come to you first to talk about best practices from the Indeed side, and then John kind of provide the BPO uh, perspective. Um, as we know, monitoring of, of agreed upon KPIs is extremely important uh, as uh, the relationship develops between a BPO uh, and a brand. Uh, so Prabhu, could you talk a little bit about at a high level uh, Indeed's process and then maybe provide some tips uh, for the other brands that are tuned in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think without giving off too much about how we operate as a company, we're still private, right? I think we'll talk about just a bits of things because I think uh, it's really hard to get a one size spent all or measuring performance at a vendor or partner because we have all partners perform a wide variety of different things. And I think um, we tend to bucket these under three big broad buckets. One, we call them the content pillar. Uh, we call it our support pillar, we call them our product pillar. Product pillar is activities like uh, data labeling, measurement, activities. And I think our content pillar is anything where it involves a content moderation. For us, and indeed, we collect a lot of data. And I'll give you some examples of how much data we collect, right? I think a, a job is a piece of content, right? A review about a company is a piece of content. You know, Indeed has over 300 million uh, unique visitors that come in. We have over 750 million reviews or ratings on the platform. Uh, we have over 1.1 billion salaries. A lot of this, we have certification data. So a lot of that ties in there. So for us, measuring each almost at the past level is critical. So I have to get down to the level of being like, hey, this is, for example, a cue that monitors what certifications you need to apply to a nursing role in, say, for the example, in the state of Georgia, right? Not very specific. So we have to take a look at it and say, um, do we have the right measurements at the cue level? So it, it gets very nitty gritty, just then trying to extrapolate this up into the I would get travel on that and say, okay, do we have the right metrics to monitor some of it? So I think, again, tooling is super critical for us. I think getting consensus right, you know, we, we talk about measuring quality in terms of consistency and accuracy and then building consensus, right? Because consistency could be uh, everybody is doing or answering in the same way, but it could be wrong. That's why accuracy is also important. It can be very consistent and wrong. But we don't want that. We want it to be consistent and accurate. So I think when we're measuring data, we have to look at different points of it to say, and also consensus. Are multiple pe people, if you ask them to save question, planning or ready answer. So some of our cues, we measure quality by consensus of three or four, right? Depending on how important this data is and how we're measuring this data or where we're using it in a business application. This is revenue generating that we'd like higher consensus. But if it's like, just telling us a signal, then that's a different level. So hopefully it, it's a, it's a big mixed bag, but you know, I, I'm happy to start your already. It's a more way too. Great. Great. Uh, John, John, what are your thoughts uh, from the BPO standpoint? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because you, I, I, I promise everything's all good with my nine bridge. I'm just using it as the analogy. Want to send this link to your wife? No. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do the song. Let's see, no one else. Well, <laughs> but no, like I, so I think is it, the, if you use marriage as the analogy, like once you're hitting your groove, like you start off the relationship, you're trying to kind of feel around and like WBRs and daily interactions, like what's meaningful, what's tactical. And then, you know, when you get to your first QBR, you should be kind of start starting to kind of put wrappers into what the strategy is. Like, what are you going to look for in the next 90 days? And then how do you measure that in these WBRs? Like, 
getting to that next QBR crescendo. That's how I look at it. Okay. And then, then it, what I kind of, what I love most about the partnership with Indeed is then you can like kind of, once you get into that groove, then you can kind of say, Hey, uh, you know, the, you know, Indeed team pitches a ball over and says, Hey, Ibex, have you tried this? Let's go try something with email or this, just see how that works. And then you can then kind of take that and build something off of that. And to me, I think that's like the the pinnacle of where you're not only building trust between the two sides to take a little bit of risk and play off each other, but understanding of, of kind of probably your point of like all the kind of the key ingredients of the KPIs that make that successful. And then I think you can kind of go and try some do, new things, as I'd say in the lab, if you will, to see, hey, but you know, what what happens if we do this? And then how do you measure that again? And that's, uh, that's uh, I think, how I would look at it and, and approach that very problem, but love yes thoughts. Yeah, no, no, I agree with that. I think it's all about experimentation. Indeed, you know, believes in experimentation. It's trying multiple things. Uh, it's also being able to recognize that not everything we try will be successful and making sure that we have that built into our system to, to have some level of like, oh, some of these initiatives we try are going to fail and we're okay with it as long as we know what that damage is, right? It's not like saying, just call up when you're talking to customers randomly, try things and, and then at the expense of customers, but there is a sandbox, right? Into being like, okay, can we try something? And then do we know what we're trying without impacting the end customer too much, right? Can we try a different tool for quality? Should we change some of the attributes to see what motivates that and ease it, right? Like, Trying those experiments are, I think, valid. Yeah, yeah, good, good clarification. Really a point. Yeah. Well, like that guy said, we should just try and fail and break things. It's like, well, not, not really. Right, right. No, that's good. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the experimentation piece. I think that's interesting. So, probably, if you had some advice uh, for CX practitioners who are listening to this webinar, um, what parameters would you provide? to them for experimentation? I mean, what, what is not enough experimentation and what is too much experimentation? I'll use the example from the past and I'll try to convey it back to the to the present or the future, right? I think, uh, you know, a, a, a decision tree is always a questionable CX practice, right? Some people believe in it, love it. Some people hate it. I think a decision tree sometimes allows you to, to test your hypothesis. And if, if you try to, push someone down this decision pathway. Is this a better experience or not, right? I think it could be the same solution, but you're just trying different things to solve it. Even if you take a, a technical example, we, you know, a customer wants a refund. What if we offered them some other suggestions before giving them the refund? Or it's supposed to be like, okay, customer asked me for a refund and gave them, but that's an experiment you could t test to see, are customers just happy taking the refund? Or are we actually pushing them away and long-term it's not a good thing because we don't have loyal customers because we've just given them the refund and it's a disservice to them too, right? Because we're not helping them solve the problem. Let's say, because we're, we're in the business of helping people get jobs in experimentation, there would be, hey, I don't know how to use the platform, give me a refund. Yeah, sure. We could just give them a refund, but are they doing the right thing? Or instead, should we then offer to say, hey, can we help you understand this better? And that's why I, I typically don't tend to care too much about how long they spend with the customer. It just depends on, are they educating the customer? Are they helping them evangelize the brand, right? I mean, helping spread knowledge in the community. And even if that phone call took three times as long, but we've now converted a customer to be an active pro user of the platform, that's a huge win for us, right? So that's an experiment you could trust. Great. No, that's awesome. And and John, when it comes to um, um, collaborating with brands to build out these experimentations, uh, what are some of the the best practices from the BPO side? I mean, I think it's a, like sharing back to the client, like what, where are some of the breakage points um, that's causing agents inability to drive the desired result? So then that information, I think, helps the the our clients kind of understand like okay maybe, maybe to kind of to Prabhu's point if you're 
building something on refunds, but you've handcuffed the agent so much they can't do that because of process, then how do you kind of relay, here's all the process steps that's kind of preventing what your desired goal is. So then, you know, Prabhu and his team can go back and go, got it, understand. Okay, so maybe we need to make some tweaks on the back end so this is more meaningful um, because you can kind of make things and then in practice, you you may have like trained agents to do a behavior way before and this change actually kind of prohibits them from doing it because they're still working on a methodology or a process flow that prevents them to getting there. And so our job is to go back to the to the partner and say, here's your breakage points, maybe this, 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 and here are going to help you. And now I think it's time for us to transition into data and, and data-driven decision-making. Um, probably I'll come to you again first with this. Uh, as we all know, uh, access to data and insights is very important for any CX program. Can you speak a little bit about how Indeed leverages data to make smart decisions, to implement changes, et cetera? Sure. Um, I think... You know, it's it's in our uh, value system. It's uh, it's what we write it down, right? I think if you look at the Indeed values on the Indeed page, it lists the data driven as an actual value. I think it's very useful. I, I think to speak it, I think it's a simple step, but I think it's important to be like, yes, we are data driven, it, and you know, we collect a ton of data, but at the same time, it, it, the constant question for me is always, are we collecting the right data, and is it structured in the right way? Because most tech companies today collect millions and billions of data, but is it actually be usable? Then I'll go back to the same example of a refund call, right? Do we have the right call coding? At the end of the call, can the agent tag this to the right form? And this is why there's sometimes people are like, hey, just put other, right? We have a lot of data. We collect it. It says other. I'm like, I can't use this data to actually make an intelligent decision. So I think having structured data that actually makes sense and it can evolve as we change, I think is important. So having the concept of, I think, building thoughtfully what our data streams look like and how we can make decisions with them, I think is important. And constantly reevaluating the sprite TJ and making sure that we have thoughtful design at the beginning of this and how we're using it. And if we're not using some data, I think to stop collecting it, I think we sometimes over pivot on just collect it all but I think that's where we, we can get into trouble. So I think it's being very thoughtful and meaningful about what we're collecting and how we're using it and if we're not using it to stop collecting. But I know it doesn't exactly answer the question, but it is a big topic. We could sit here and talk there all week. You know. that's, uh, for the next, that's for the next uh, webinar. <laughs> so John, can you talk a little bit about Within, from within the contact center, all the data that's generated, how that's leveraged, how it's shared with with brands, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of, I look at data, it's funny, probably you brought something into my head. It's like, you, you're capturing data, I think ultimately to, to achieve two, two functions, right? I look at it as like taking, I like to use the word grind. What's the grind on the customer to get to their desired result. That's one, right? And then two is, what is the grind that's preventing an agent from getting what the customer is looking to achieve? Um, and a lot of that that data then filters into the contact center. What I love is like sometimes, like if, you, if your KPIs could get, could get in the way to give you the right data, I'll give you an example of this. If you're AHT driven and go to the next call, next call, then an agent, if they're capturing data, is going to pick the easiest one. And I love your word, other, because they're not going to think. There's go other, 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 because it's easy, 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 easy button, easy button, right? And then that data you've collected is absolutely worthless. Um, but if we, Barry, I think to your point, your question here is, if we as the partner notice, hey, a large chunk of your data coming back is other. And the reason is because you're driving this KPI that is driving the agent to pick other. Then as a partner, I think we're having the right discussions because then either you, I think as a partner I have to ask is, is the data we're trying to capture, is that really meaningful? If the answer to that is yes, 
then do we need to tweak the KPI to allow us to get to that meaningful data? Or do we, if it's that meaningful, maybe you just don't want to capture it at all because in this environment, maybe HT is more important. I think it's just an example of that, but that's kind of collecting that along the way and then making it consumable for our partners to kind of understand real world application. Well, thanks, Chad. And uh, interesting, uh, something that just occurred to me is uh, the potential need for mm, a tweak in strategy based on selecting the wrong KPIs um, to focus on. Can you two talk a little bit about what that process would look like uh, from the brand and from the BPO perspective? I think if you have a familiar business or, or you have a business that's been running in-house and you want to move it to be, you know, there's various scenarios of how we find a BPO partner, what business we move. I think some of it could be to the existing process we've been doing and currently it, it no longer uh, makes business logic for us to move ourselves. So we want to move it to a partner, but it could be something pretty new the Portland aware of. And I think this is where this would most likely occur is that it's a new business to us. We've moved it to a partner and then we're like trying to figure out what the right metrics are to do. So based on, hey, I, I talk about this like business. Oh, we have something similar to this. So we're going to start measuring these KPIs. So let's say, for example, it's a phone business, right? We can always be like, hey, we want to make sure that we have a um, assumption for what the volume looks like in a weekly, monthly, uh, quarterly basis, I think that's a standard method. Third, then we'll say uh, we, if it's a queue that's talking to customers or an internal one, we talk about to talk about the satisfaction in that phone call, right? But at the end of it, it could be what we learned something. It could be that actually what we care more about uh, professional services or not selling some product for this, right? And then we don't even mention that anymore. And so that could be because the business has changed or what we're doing or the offerings we have are evolved. So not to be a, a, an area where we can change it and tweak it to understand that. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, great conversation. I know we talked about evaluation process, uh, early stage launch, and then managing the, the relationship uh, as it moves along. It's now time to transition to Q&A with the last few minutes we have here. Had some great questions come in. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, we've picked out some of the key ones. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. So Prabhu, first question is for you. Uh, earlier, you mentioned change tolerance. Can you talk a little bit about how Indeed measures change tolerance and, and some of the traits uh, CX practitioners should be looking for? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. Uh, I think um, change change logs, I think I'm a big believer in change logs, whatever. What I mean in that sense is, do we... Are we cataloging each change as we're making them? And it's not every little change, right? Like, you know, change the share or like add one person. And I think it's like, do we do we know what we're changing? And do we have owners for each change? And do we know the impact of the change before we implement it? I think there is a little bit of thought that goes before you can implement the change law. And I think that change law comes very closely associated to a risk factor, right? If we change this, do we know what risk it is? Do we... So... so Happy pre agreed or or having some kind of understanding with your partner and your internal business to understand what those are and having those documented, I think is important. We've run cheese through a plugin from one of my um, uh, previous employers, Jira. You know, all of our changes are tracked through Jira. There's a service ticket. We can go back and look at all of it. We have a business fees associated to it, and we kind of have an understanding of if there's a cost associated to this, or if it's just a business decision, or if it's and people removing people. So I think having a change management system is important and documenting each change and who's the owner of that change is critical too. So I think and that's a good, easy way is to catalog change and, and have a system for it. It could be a, a, a sheet in which you're ending it. Don't need, need fancy tolls. It's just, do we have a record of it and tracking it? Oh, thank you. And John, any thoughts on, on change tolerance? I'll just be real quick. I think it is... Um, just making sure that we as the partner are analyzing like what the impact is at the agent level, because there's obviously been training and, and whatnot that happens. And you want to make sure that you are um, putting that information organizationally across the board. So you understand, is there agent impact? Because if there's agent impact, then there's likely customer impact because there are, that's just you know, kind of how, how we would want to look at that. So I, I think that would be my only add on to that. 
Thanks for that, John. Uh, we have time for one more question. And the question is related to data analytics and um, business intelligence. Uh, so Prabhu, when you're evaluating the capabilities of a BPO provider, uh, can you talk about what you're looking for in terms of uh, their abilities? Sure. Um, I think uh, we talked about it. I think we, we talked about certain criteria for what we look at. I think the value system is important. That one's like the last day to judge it, right? Because do they have the right value systems? Do we share a value system together? Is there some uh, the, the, the culture? Does it match? I think those are less. I, I want to talk first about the non data specific ones. And these are very important too, right? Like, do they have the right culture? Is there a right fit for us? I think when you start talking about data um, from a BPO provider, you want to look at locations. I think it's very important. Do they have the spread of locations? Are they a partner where we can expand with them in the future? Uh, what languages, because it indeed supports multiple languages, we are always looking at what languages do we have. I think that's an important data point. I think pricing points are important. I think the second point is, um, is is quality at some of these shared functions run on the same DNA. Because what you don't want to do is come engage with the BPO partner and then you're dealing with multiple locations and it's like dealing with a completely different company every time you engage with them in say for example in Asia or the Caribbean or in the, in the America fight you know, I don't want to do that. I think do they have the right back end or it seems seamless and it seems like we're talking to the same company or the same thing irrespective of what site or location in the RAD. I think for that, that goes back to, is the company have the right tooling and innovation? Do they share the data? Are they able to process this and provide this feedback real time? Can I give you feedback somewhere here? That's implemented globally. Is there a global run business, right? Is there a global book that you can treat it that way? Because it's some providers, it's really complicated. You go and work in one country and then it's great. And then you go to another country with the same provider. And that's like, why don't I do this? That was like, you know, not the, the best experience at all. And then, you know, your customers are suffering because of that too, you know? Those are just a few. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, John, any thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, in, it's always about continuous improvement, not resting on your laurels then, you know, ultimately what business intelligence drives, um, at least from our perspective, is as we continue to mature in our partnerships with our clients, that we are continuously taking the data that we gather in the contact center, which for the, for the most of our programs is coming from the, from the customer, right? Taking that customer data and, and relaying it back to our partners so it's actionable and giving those insights and not every, never, not every insight is actionable to the point that you want to make big process changes, but some are ones in which, you know, are really, really valuable. Other ones, you know, maybe not so much, but it, 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 it's our job to kind of put that back to our partners and then kind of look into the business always inwardly at how we can drive continuous improvement throughout the, the, the legacy of the partnership with our customers. And that wraps up our webinar. Thank you so much, John and Prabhu for uh, being our speakers today. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us for how Indeed and IBEX built an insights-driven CX partnership. Hopefully you got some useful information uh, during this webinar. Uh, once again, this webinar is being recorded, so we will share the link with everyone that registered. And we hope to see you again on the next IBEX webinar. Thanks and have a great day. Bye.